welcome to our audience here and also to the Zoom audience for a new episode of French American Stories, One Story, Two Narratives. Uh, so it's a monthly program on French American history, French American stories, and particularly exchanges between France and America over history, through history, and especially going up until today. So today we have the honor of having Paul Glenshaw uh, with us to talk about the very fascinating topic of jazz in Paris. It's lovely to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to say a few little things before we actually start is that for those that are on Zoom, but also for you, of course, uh, you have the opportunity of asking questions after our interview. And we will have uh, video clips here on the screen and on your screen on Zoom. But unfortunately, the sound will not work on Zoom because of a little difficulty that we were not able to fix. But there's good news because we will actually um, have the video uploaded soon with the sound because it will be edited later. But it's not a reason to leave Zoom immediately <laughs> because, of course, we're going to just discuss and there will be a few little clips that you will not be able to hear. But you will see the slides and, of course, hear everything else. So let's start. Um, so first of all, you're working now on a documentary on the subject of jazz in Paris. So could you provide a little overview of the project and particularly what inspired you to delve into this fun subject of jazz in Paris? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I, um, I'm a documentary filmmaker, uh, among other things. And I mean, what inspired me to do this, you know, Jazz rearranged my molecules when I was a teenager here in Washington, <laughs> D.C. I discovered it um, at the Cool Jazz Festival when I was just a kid. I didn't know anything about the music, but there was just something so completely magical and captivating about it for me that I, I just got immersed instantly and have <laughs> never come up for air. So it's been a wonderful way to, to live a life. Um, and then fell in love with Paris um, uh, when I was in college. But there was a girl involved, and uh, she's sitting right over there. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, my background is in painting, is in studying art. And um, so the love of Paris, love of the, the city, and then this music. And then as I became more interested in French American stories, my last film was about the Escadrille Lafayette, who were the American volunteer fighter pilots who volunteered for France during the First World War. Um, really diving into that story and looking at the reasons those guys volunteered to, you know, give their lives for a country that, in, that was in a war that wasn't even their own. Um, but they did it because they felt this debt to Lafayette and Rochambeau from the American Revolution. And, and just, just, just the number of exchanges I've had with different, uh, with French folks in all different walks of life, um, and just the richness of the culture, the richness of the history and the richness of the interchange between just has become something very fascinating. So when my film partner, Derek Greer and I were scouting around for something else to, you know, what was gonna be our next film, we decided we very much did not wanna do another sad, depressing war film, uh, which World War I very much is, but something joyous where something is bringing people together. And Jazz in Paris is the perfect story for that. And as we'll discuss a bit later, there is a very clear military story. There really the story is. Of death. Yes. Yeah. Before we dive into that military story, can we talk more about the, the context of Paris before the arrival of jazz? And can you just situate the story we're going to tell today um, in history? So what was Paris at that time? Um, what do you plan to describe in the movie particularly, of course, but especially what is the musical scene before this arrival of jazz? And yes. I mean, what's the artistic background? Well, that's where we'll jump into some, some slides here. So this will be kind of an illustrated interview. So when we're talking about uh, the arrival, jazz began to arrive um, in, a, in a sort of very, very early form during the First World War. Um, that's the military aspect of the story. So, and that's of course this cataclysmic event um, across Europe, really, and all around the world, but particularly in France. And before that happened, though, um, the culture in Paris was sort of the perfect place for jazz to find a home. Of course, jazz was created in New Orleans, Louisiana, at the turn of the 20th century, um, and at that same period in particularly all over Paris, but let's focus on Montmartre right now. Um, 
places where people could go and hear music in small venues um, was a well-established thing. Of course, the Café Concert, you think of, you know, the famous things during the famous uh, Belle Epoque with, um, you know, the Moulin Rouge and uh, the Moulin de la Galette, you know, Renoir painted these things, Toulouse-Lautrec, you know, that, that was already a very established thing. So it was something called the Bal Musette. <laughs> This was music that you could find played in clubs, small night spots for working class people. Um, this was um, music that was really an amalgam of, of a couple of different cultures, French country music, but then also these accordions that came from Italy. And this was very, very popular among working class folks. So the whole idea of going to a small venue, hearing music, um, and, and local musicians playing it, you know, of course, this is not just particular to Paris, but this is what there was in Paris musically at the time. But this was also the time of an incredibly rich and shocking, even dramatic explosion of culture with people like Picasso in 1905, the Demoiselle d'Avignon and Matisse, you know, they were called the wild beasts, the foves, you know, so like new, exciting, shocking. Um, the Ballet Russe was, uh, you know, at its height at this period, you know, Stravinsky famously um, um, premiered the Rite of Spring, and you know, and there was a riot. So, stuff that was new and bold um, was part of the whole uh, milieu of Paris, but also American popular music and a new form of American popular music started to come over um, in the form of two American dancers, Vernon and Irene Castle. Um, they were very popular here, um, and they came over to Paris with their new dances, the Foxtrot, the Turkey Trot, um, and the Castle Walk. We'll hear a few minutes, few seconds of it. <laughs> This is Black American music. Their musical director was James Reese Europe, who had done a significant portion of his growing up here in Washington, D.C. But up in New York, he, this was his band, the Clef Club, over 100 members, the first African-American orchestra to play at Carnegie Hall. And he was writing original Black American music, syncopated American music. And uh, so how did that come to Paris? Then? How did that come to yeah. Paris? Well, this is the military part of yeah. the story <laughs> that Iris alluded to. So yeah. when the war began, uh -huh. um, of, of course, the United States did not join the war, but Americans volunteered in 1914 and black Americans volunteered in 1914, fought with the Foreign Legion. But when the American army started, there was a unit that was uh, uh, put together of black soldiers in upstate New York. And the commander, they became the, the Harlem Hellfighters, the 369th. They became the most decorated American uh, unit in the war. Um, and they fought under French command because they were not, the white American commanders didn't let them fight under them. And their band was led by James Reese Europe. <laughs> So what I was just playing was the... Um, so maybe we can describe a little yeah. bit for the Zoom audience. So for the, hear this. Yes, so, so for the Zoom audience, what I, was, what I was just playing was something called the Memphis Blues, written by W.C. Handy. This is syncopated music. And, and when the, the band first came to France, um, as part of the, the 369th Infantry uh, Unit, they did a tour of France playing this music. Like, they got off the boat and started to play. And they did a syncopated version of the Marseillaise. And like the French audience couldn't believe it. And they went all over France and people just couldn't get enough of this music. It was so new and so exciting. And French musicians were coming up to them and inspecting the instruments because they were absolutely convinced they had trick instruments. There's no way you could. And they were in a lot of cases playing French instruments, playing Selmers. So there were no tricks. Um, so it became very, very popular. And then one of the extraordinary things that happened is after they did this tour, and that's them performing in an alleyway next to a Red Cross hospital in Paris. Um, after they made this tour, the instruments were packed up and they went into the trenches. 
And Jim Europe, the band leader, was the first African-American officer to go into no man's land. He was a machine gunner and they survived and uh, came out. So that sort of planted the seed. Mm -hmm. And then when the war ended, many of the black soldiers who fought, several decided to stay and several went back home to the United States and decided, you know, that Jim Crow life is not for me and came back to Paris. And can you delve a little bit deeper in that? Because in Paris, of course, they arrive in a non-segregated society. Right. So for some of these black soldiers, it was a new experience to, to realize this is also possible. Absolutely. What did they bring back from that experience back to America? Well, in a lot of <laughs> cases, they didn't bring it back to America because they simply stayed. Okay. You know, they found, well, or it was just such a shock to go back to America. Well, first, it was a huge shock to go to France and... You know, they were in the segregated American army, which wouldn't, you know, didn't want them fighting combat, but the French took them and did very well with them. But just, and there were very strict rules that the American army put down about no fraternizing with the French public or anything like that. But when they were able to be in Paris and, and other places in France and could go to whatever restaurant they wanted and, you know, go to whatever bakery they wanted or just live their lives and just, you know, and play music. And <laughs> then when they came back and started playing this music, it just, you know, it was, it was, mm. it was, there was also a very pro-American feeling amongst a lot of ordinary French people because the American entry into the war tipped the balance mm -hmm. and the allies won. Yes. And so can you explain the popularity of jazz in Paris? Like why was particularly Paris as a city so receptive for this new musical genre that arrived in the way you just described? And because, of course, it was, as you said, already a vibrant cultural place. So, yeah, well, there was great interest. Um, you know, Picasso famously was very interested. Uh, he's a very good example of somebody who was very interested in African art before the war. There was a great, there was a sort of surge of interest in black artists um, from America and from other parts of the world in Paris. So there was a receptiveness there. There was a there was an, a, a dire need for something new. You know, they've just come through this horrible, catastrophic thing, and here's this brand new music. Jazz was brand new by the end of the First World War, 1918. Music is not even 20 years old. So it's still very new. And to be hearing it for the first time, because without live musicians, you know, radio isn't playing, the records are barely there. It was this absolutely fascinating thing and just so danceable. Mm -hmm. And that's what they wanted. So that whole world that they had before of dance music in new halls and things. And now here's this new American music that has a little exotic exoticism to it and it's just so much fun to hear and it's so much fun to dance to and and they're improvising you know what is that you know <laughs> just everything about it was it was avant-garde and totally part of could be part of everybody's life at the same time and particularly what you say the dancing and maybe forgetting that awful period that was the first world war particularly in france of course many frenchmen in particular, died like even today. The monuments you can see in every little town. It's it was one of the worst, of course. So the fact that there is some fun to be had is maybe yes. yeah. The music brought joy, and mm -hmm. I think that was so. It was it was the right thing in the right place mm. at the right time. And then the, also these musicians, these American artists, discovering just this life of a life they've never known before, mm -hmm. which is. I can do whatever I want. Yeah. Imagine that. And can you maybe then explore a bit more or develop on, of course, the, the first world war is the, the moment, the catalyst for jazz to arrive. But then, of course, many other American artists came to Paris to perform. Some would live there. Yeah. Um, so first of all, how is the perception of the, the um, of them in the musical scene? Like they, of course, integrated easily. They were playing. They were invited in all the different concert halls, music places. Yes. Um, would you have some examples of those that came to Paris and became very famous there? Yeah, I, I've, I've prepared a few for everybody to see here. So this is the Southern Sync Ops Orchestra, another big orchestra led by a guy named Will Marion Cook. This is them in New York. Um, and they were a very formal sort of a dance band but they played syncopated music, but there was one member of the band who was allowed to solo. He was this 19 year old prodigy from New Orleans named Sidney Bechet. 
Um, and so Sidney Bechet at the time, he was mostly playing clarinet. This is sort of uh, late or early 1920s, late teens, early 20s when they come over, but he's the only one who's allowed to improvise. So I'll play a little bit of that. <laughs> And Bechet became one of the first American, Black American jazz musicians to stay in Paris. There, there, were, there was a handful of them at the time. And you'll see it grew into a, a small but growing community. Um, and um, I'll give you just a little bit of a flavor of the nightlife there in Paris at the time. Um, American entrepreneurs started to open clubs like Joe Zelli. And, and this, the, the focus was in the northern part of the city, in Montmartre. As you can see, you know, a completely integrated band. And one of the guys who was very instrumental in this whole period was Eugene Bullard, who um, had volunteered in the Foreign Legion. He'd survived the war. He survived the Battle of Verdun, which is unbelievable. Um, he worked for Joe Zelli and then opened his own nightclub. And that was one of the other things was that Black Americans could become entrepreneurs. Um, and in fact, um, his little club, Le Grand Duc, he... Uh, <laughs> Uh, he was the manager of it, and one day this uh, young guy came looking for a job. He had seven dollars in his pocket. He'd just shown up in France, and uh, he uh, Bullard could offer him a dishwasher job, and it was Langston Hughes, the poet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there you see on this slide the, uh, the this is sort of the uh, sort of original Black American colony of musicians. As you can see, it's all men at this point, um, but a lot of Musicians, and, and what's interesting about these guys is they were kind of behind the curve in terms of how the music was played mm. because it was still so new. And there were a lot of developments that were happening in the United States, particularly with Louis Armstrong, Joe Oliver, you know, these great musicians in the 1920s. They're, as their advancements in the music were happening, it, there was a lag because the records had to make their way by boat over to, to Paris. <laughs> so... The Americans, so the Americans were trying to catch up to their own countrymen. They were always a little bit behind. And then the French were still learning how to play this. So they were a little bit behind them. So there was this kind of march towards coming up to coming up to speed, which of course, eventually they did. <laughs> and, um, oh, maybe there were some, some more. Yeah, yeah, a couple other just in, very notable examples, of course. And it was um, uh, another 19-year-old, Josephine Baker, who came over to perform in this show, the Revue Negre, um, and in the band was Sidney Bechet. Um, and of course she became this icon of, um, just, well, she became an icon of France actually. Absolutely. Still today. She Still is today. very much celebrated. Yeah. 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 Uh, we went and visited her, uh, where her remains are laid at the, um, at the Pantheon. Pantheon, yes. Um, <clears throat> but she came to epitomize the entire, um, African-American culture, um, the freedom it represented, and she just became this fashion icon. Um, never mind that she wasn't actually a jazz musician. She didn't sing like a jazz musician, but she was a she was this dancer, and she was just such an enormous presence. Let me back up. Um, sorry, you all right? Um, so, but it was really in the 1930s um, when Duke Ellington came to Paris. He was touring Europe and came to Paris in 1933. And that was a huge moment for the music in the city and for him. Because Ellington's orchestra was not playing in the little clubs. Ellington's orchestra was playing at the South Playa. It's enormous, very, it's, you know, like playing the Kennedy Center or Carnegie Hall. Um, and there was such anticipation for him, him arriving because he was already regarded as such a great composer, hmm. which he was not in the United States. And so these performances that he gave and the reception that he got um, was very important. 
And after that, when he came back to the United States, Ellington was no longer promoted as just a dance band leader, but as a great composer as well. But that was first recognized in Europe and in France, it was huge. Also, Louis Armstrong came over in 1933, actually to recover from an injury. He was on this grueling tour of Europe and when he was on stage in London, he split his lip and he went to Paris to basically hang out <laughs> for three fair. months. But the fact that the great Louis Armstrong was there was just such a shot in the arm for these fledgling French jazz musicians, you know, who wanted so desperately to see him. And of course, one of them was Django Reinhardt. Um, and we'll hear what Armstrong had to say. I, you, Zoom audience, I'm sorry, you won't be able to hear it, but I'll, I'll, I'll repeat what he says. Um, but Armstrong being in Paris, you know, so, so it's the, the level of the musicianship um, has really risen. Um, what was interesting, though, was it was um, a pair of Frenchmen who were only amateur musicians, but who had a huge amount to do with raising the profile of jazz and actually had to do a lot ultimately with its preservation and sustainability. Um, it was this man, Hugues Panassier um, and Charles Delaunay. And they weren't the founders, but they, be, they became the, the leaders of the, the Hot Club of France. And that, yeah, that's where, yeah. what would be interesting to talk about is, so there is, of course, the Americans come and there's a French right. audience. The French audience loves the music. They all dance to it. It's a very exciting moment, of course, of, of history there. But of course, there's also some French artists that were inspired by jazz and became themselves jazz musicians. Yes. So you're already starting to talk about that, but can you maybe expand a little bit on that and really the reaction of the French music scene to jazz and to adopt that music uh, in their own circles, I'd say. Yes, there were um, French composers who were very interested, French classical, we call them classical, but orchestral composers who were very interested in the music uh, from a very early period. Um, and, and I guess the thing that's so different is just how seriously they took it as music of genius. Mm. And they were, they were, I mean, there was no hesitating about calling it music of genius, you know. Um, uh, uh, you know, they started their own publications and so forth. Um, now, this is this is what you'll hear Louis Armstrong say about the greatest pioneer of jazz, French jazz, uh, Django Reinhardt. Oh, wait. Oh, the sound isn't there. But he said, you know, I met Django Reinhardt when I went to Paris back then in 1934. And he said, oh, boy, that boy sure could play. <laughs> like, that's the highest praise <laughs> you could get. You know, if Louis Armstrong says... You could play because that's, I think, the thing that makes it so interesting. We'll talk, touch on this when we talk about democracy and how it really represents democracy. Is is jazz is, is it's a music, it's it's a total meritocracy because either you can play or you can't. Mm. And if you and it's, it's, so it, it either swings or it doesn't. And it swings because everybody's listening to each other and exchanging ideas and and accommodating but also putting forth what they want to say. And so it's that interplay, that dynamicism, which is just so exciting and always taking place in the moment. And the fact that here was this guy, Django Reinhardt, who, you know, came from, you know, absolutely grinding poverty, you know, the glittering city of Paris. Well, just outside the gates was a place called La Zone, this huge sprawling slum. And that's where he lived. He lived in a, you know, gypsy caravan, um, which... Um, caught fire when he was 19 years old and it burned his hand that he played the guitar with terribly. Um, he only had two working fingers and he completely revolutionized the guitar as an instrument for jazz. Um, everybody wanted Django Reinhardt. As soon as Ellington heard him for the first time, wanted to hire him on the spot. Um, Django teams up with Stefan Greppel, who was a conservatory trained guy. Django learned on the streets. Greppel learned in the conservatory, but he also learned how to swing. And they created the very first authentic French jazz where there was no bass, no drums, no horns. Just, well, bass, sorry. But no horns, no drums, just strings, guitars, bass. And that's typically Five. French. That's yeah. the, really the French road it went in. That's yeah. It. And that was really... Um, sort of when French jazz really started to come into its own was through them. 
And was there a lot of collaboration between the French and American musicians, or was it really the French took it and kind of went their own way? <laughs> oh, no, there was an enormous amount of collaboration. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you just look at Django Reinhardt's recordings by themselves, um, you know, he had his own band, the Quintet of the Hot Club, um, but uh, he was also playing with people like Bill Coleman, Coleman Hawkins, um, uh, Rex Stewart, so many American musicians who had either relocated to Paris or were just staying for a short time in Paris or staying for an extended time in Paris. I mean, everybody recorded mm -hmm. with him. So there was a ton of interchange. As the French musicians, and there's a few of them on the screen here, Gus Vizur, who, you know, reached back to the accordion to bring that into jazz, at least Combelle on tenor. And uh, the guy on the end there, uh, Leo Vauchon, he was a very interesting guy because when jazz was really first starting to take root, um, the famous Maurice Ravel, composer was fascinated by it. And Vauchon was an early adapter and quite good. He was only 19. And for a time, I think it was every Thursday afternoon, he would go around to Ravel's house and Ravel would show, have him show him how he improvised. Like, how do you do it? I, that's something, and like pulling jazz tunes apart. So this 19 year old kid was giving lessons to Ravel. So that's an interesting way of seeing the exchanges of yeah. what you're saying, like the French American exchanges, even Ravel may be influenced in his own ways. Who knows? But anyway, so I think it's very interesting to think about these exchanges, but also did the Americans then bring the more French side back kind of if they would come, would you say the French had an influence on American jazz? Oh, certainly. Certainly. I mean, without a doubt. And, and well, the other thing is that um, these American musicians were becoming more and more exposed to what had come before jazz in French music. Mm -hmm. were very attracted to it, very attracted to the music of Debussy, very attracted to mm -hmm. Ravel, very attracted to Stravinsky. Um, there was so much that was that was very exciting to them. Um, and then just as these bands would form and reform and shape shift, shape, yeah. um, it just became deeper and deeper. Mm -hmm. And so that's all happening mainly in the in the 20s, 30s, 40s. How did jazz evolve since that time up until, well, now is maybe too broad. <laughs> but can you describe a little bit of that evolution of jazz over the years? Because, of course, it's still so important for us today. There's so many jazz clubs still in France. It's Absolutely. a buzzing scene. Yeah. So, of course, during the Second World War, France was occupied. Um, but curious. And Jazz was officially banned, but curiously, at the same time, it was the most lucrative period of Django Reinhardt's career. He was performing all the time in Paris under Nazi occupation. Go figure. Um, he wrote the song Nuage, which became sort of an unofficial anthem for the uh, French resistance during the war. But after the war, really the locus of the music moved to the left bank. Mm. Um, there, were, there was a much stronger youth culture there after the war. Um, Rex Stewart, who I mentioned before, he had been a trumpet player in Ellington's band. Right after the war, he was one of the first American bands to come back. And it's interesting because it was kind of a replay of what happened after the First, the first World War, is that yeah. a new generation now of Black American musicians came to Paris and found this place where they could do their thing. And Rex Stewart, of course, had been there before the war, and he came back and he wasn't too sure, you know, how things were going to be. And they got to, uh, I think it was the Gare du Nord. They came in on the train and there was a band of young Parisians waiting for them on the platform and played note perfect several of Rex Stewart's recordings back at him. You know, they had learned every single note and they played it right back from, they were just waiting for him to get it. And he was like, <laughs> wow, you know, um, that's Rex. Um, and that's also an important story, what you're saying about uh, the black soldiers, and then they come back and there's this famous moment of the, the double V campaign and civil rights movements really kicking off. So Absolutely. And there is, uh, again, so many other um, uh, black American artists, white American artists too, but a lot of you know people like Richard Wright, James Baldwin, Nina Simone is there in Paris for a long time. Um, uh, Hazel Scott is there. Um, and there was this freedom again, and it really in many ways was a, a repeat of what had happened in the 1920s, just with a much more updated form of music in the form of bebop. Um, the kind of queen and king of that 
uh, neighborhood in Paris in the 50s were Boris Vion and Juliette Greco. Boris was this polymath. He was a, I think he was, he studied physics in school. He was a novelist. He wrote screenplays, poems. He played the trumpet. He had a jazz band. He had a jazz band. He had a jazz club. Juliet was, you know, this muse, actor, singer. And they, the two of them just, you know, epitomized the whole, that whole scene with us, um, Sartre and, and everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yes, and so maybe because um, we could talk more about the evolution up until today. Yeah. But also, I think what's interesting is what you have already mentioned. What we've ever discussed is that idea of um, rights. People rep like going to Paris, realizing that different rights are, of course, there. And this goes to the subject of democracy that you've already touched upon. Because of course, one of the most important things that binds French and France and America is their shared ideas of democracy, of liberties, of equalities that, of course, have been fought for since the 18th century, but in America had taken um, a very different shape than it had taken in France. And we're not here to make that whole comparison, of course, <laughs> but if we focus only on jazz, which you think it could be considered one of their expressions of shared ideas and shared values of democracy that, again, had evolved so differently, but then came back together and made people realize that that promise of equality of liberties was not achieved in the U.S., while it was in a way in France. And, of course, France is not an ideal place either. Racism is still quite apparent today, so just needed, of course, to, to make that clear. But overall, they, they did see a society that was so different from the segregation they new in the United States. Yeah. I mean, if anybody put it more succinctly, I don't know who it was, but Miles Davis, he came over in 1949 to play the Paris Jazz Festival. He was only there for a few weeks. But the experience, I mean, those of you who know who Miles Davis was, are familiar with pictures of him, there's very few pictures of him where he's got a big, broad grin on his face, where he's like genuinely happy. Um, and that, he fell in love with Julia Greco. She fell in love with him as this kind of whirlwind romance. But Miles found in Paris, it, uh, it, again, it was it was that same thing. And the way he spoke about it, he he just he had never had that kind of experience before in his life. And and so the freedom that was there in the music um, and that interchange of ideas, um, you know, the jazz really represents. Wint Marsalis talks about this a lot, and he puts he talks about it very succinctly um, that within a jazz band you 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 know because everybody's putting forward their own idea but at the same time they're listening and it has to fit with somebody else's idea and there's this constant negotiation that's going on um, that's a very democratic thing um, and it has and it has real life consequences because if they're not playing well together and it's not swinging the, the people aren't dancing and and so to feel that, in your life, just being able to live your life, you know, seeing what was promised in the music, what's promised in the laws of the United States, but not necessarily available to a large section of the population in the United States. Um, you know, it's interesting because, you, and not to go too far down the French American history route, but you look at how these ideals of democracy came from France mm -hmm. and came from the, the world of the Enlightenment you know, across many parts of Europe, but 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 huge, strong influence from France, come to the United States and, and they see in the revolution, you know, this, this experiment to try and put those into play. And then when the French have their own, you know, they have their, and, and democracy stays in the United States, just not for everyone. But that be said, but then it comes back to France and they have their revolution, democracy is sort of there and then it's gone. And then there's an emperor king, another revolution with another king, another revolution <laughs> with a little republic, then another emperor, then another republic. You know, so it's so it comes and goes in France. And so when you follow that interplay between these two groups of people trying to negotiate this thing, trying to make it work, you see, I think it's a, at the same time. And this is what people like Miles and everybody else were, I think, coming to understand is this idea is at the same time very flexible, it's very fragile, but it's very resilient. And I think that's that's one of the things about jazz in Paris is, is it's over a century now that this music has been uh, has been there. And so do you also think that it's one of the reasons that uh, it got such it was such a French American story? 
because you could say that, right? That these type of values bound the two nations and still are, and they express through jazz. So I think it's an interesting way of thinking, and maybe people don't think of jazz as sort of a democracy, as you said. Mm -hmm. So I think it is uh, an important part of the French American story that people tend to overlook because people think more about the first alliance and then the world, war world wars and things such as NATO, the UN, all these today. Yeah. But of course, culture is such an important part of relations between countries. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's, I think, a very important role that it plays still yeah. today. And even here at the French embassy in a few weeks, they're going to have a French American jazz concert. So it's something that's still very much alive, um, even at a French embassy today, because it is part of that exchange. And of course, culture is crucial and documentaries are too, <laughs> to tell these stories. Um, so maybe we can end with uh, to think uh, what you want um, as a sort of a takeaway from your documentary. And then we can maybe go see a few other examples that you have and Sure. Unfortunately for Zoom, uh, there will be a, a trailer of the um, of the documentary, but that we will add that later. But we will see it here in the audience today. Yeah. Um, yeah so I, I just had some pictures of um, some of the really notable French musicians. Um, I mean, there's it's a very very long list, but um, you know Michel Petrucciani, Marshall Solel, these are these are great French pianists. Um, interestingly, I went to visit. Um, Michel Petrucciani's grave at Père Lachaise last year. And um, I think it's three graves to the left is Frédéric Chopin. Oh. Which is pretty cool. <laughs> I was like, hey, Frédéric, you're in good company. <laughs> um, I guess what I wanted to talk about is, um, you know, obviously in preparing for this documentary and thinking about the broader and deeper themes uh, of democracy and things like that. One of the other things that is very exciting for us and the way we're pursuing this documentary is by beginning with the musicians of today. So we're commissioning um, contemporary musicians um, in France and one in the United States to, uh, to write new pieces of music um, and we'll follow them as they go through their creative process. So we'll be seeing how jazz is living and thriving today in the city. The kicker is that they're going to be writing about somebody from the past. So as they study somebody from the past, we'll take the audience back in time. So we'll be jumping back and forth between the present and the past. So we'll be learning. So we're not, it will not be strictly a chronological story starting from the beginning, marching forward. Mm -hmm. um, but it allows us to really go all over the city. It goes, allows us to go all the way through time and work with these extraordinary musicians uh, like the Django Festival All Stars, um, who really carry that tradition of uh, what Django Reinhardt began forward. Um, Leila Olavesi, who you see on the left, is a wonderful um, pianist, composer, band leader who is getting her PhD right now at the Sorbonne, writing about Duke Ellington. Um, actually, this artist on on the right. Um, uh, Céline Saint uh, Aimé, I discovered here at the French Embassy. She was performing a uh, brilliant bassist, singer, songwriter, um, and she had just finished her studies in Louisiana. A French musician coming to the United States to study the origins of Creole music here. Now that's an interesting cultural exchange, and she's in her 20s. Um, Michael Joseph Harris, uh, we'll be following him. I highly recommend for those of you in the DC area, go up to Baltimore. There's a whole thriving Django scene every year. There's the Charm City Django Fest. Um, he's a wonderful musician. Herman Mahari and Josiah Woodson are two trumpet players, American trumpet players in Paris right now who we're working with. Um, and it's so, it's so interesting because talking to them about what they love about being in Paris, Josiah had an interesting story, which was, you know, he said, I live next door to the police station. And I never think twice about calling the police. If I need them, I just call them. He said, you know, I got into a tussle the other day with a taxi driver. And I was like, you want to go to the police? <laughs> I would never think to do that back home. But here, and everybody acknowledges that France is not, you know, there's certainly plenty of racism in France. Um, but for that, for what they find, it's just a, a big difference from mm. here. Um, and then, of course, the wonderful singer Cyril uh, Aimé and uh, Cécile McLaurin Salvant, who is French American. Um, and if you have never heard either of them, they are next level. 
Um, and so in the documentary, you're asking them to make a composition, right? And then yeah. to, to focus on what history is and then what they're doing yeah. with it. And then how they interpret the history musically. Yeah. Yes. And so the, the main takeaway you want from, from your documentary, someone has watched it, how will well, the person walk away? Dancing, probably. But Well, first of all, I want them happy. Just yeah. plain out, just happy that they just feel good. Like, life is good, man. It's great. This, that music just made me so happy. And and I want to hear more of it. And and they go and they're curious and they want to go explore and and jump into this world of this music. I you know So just on a very simple level, want them happy. Um, and I want them curious. Um, but I also want them to see like how, you know, that is actually how people can get along. You know, here's a shining example. It does work. You can make it work. And it can work for a long period of time in this one place. Um, the Americans all talk about how it's just a little different in Paris. You know, New York musicians, it's funny, Josiah was saying, you know, back in New York, man, like if, if rehearsal was from 7.30 to nine, it was over at nine, <laughs> done. But here, like it'll, 7.30, well, maybe start around 8.30, goes till 10.30, 11, and then we go out. And it's like this whole thing and we're really spending time together. And there's, it's a different feeling. And, you know, we just asked him, so you ever going back? It's like, never. But it also brings these cultures together and the differences are overcome by the common ground of yeah. music. So that's the beauty. Yeah. yeah. So Very we're nice. doing things like going to, um, uh, uh, going all over the city and seeing, you know, where famous things happened. And so it'll be very much a then and now, you know, here's, here's the place where such and such happened as we see it today. Um, you know, we'll go out to Sidney Bechet's grave. He uh, relocated to Paris after the second world war. And um, uh, when he died, 10,000 people came to his funeral. Wow. Yeah. Listen to recordings of him at the Olympia theater in 1958. And it sounds like the Beatles are performing. The audience is screaming so loud. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are. All right. Thank you so much. This was very interesting, exciting, hopeful. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, yes. <laughs> and so um, we have some questions from Zoom, and then we'll have some questions, hopefully. Um, so there is a question, a specific question. First of all, some say the music don't come through. So I'm very sorry. We had that technical difficulty. But if you're really interested you can watch the video afterwards online and then you will hear the music because we can edit that problem luckily um but so there's a question here of linda who says you said the harlem hellfighters were from upstate new york uh where exactly did they come from do you know that oh if you would ask me that right yeah. off the top of my head i can't remember <laughs> um i mean they were outside the city they were the the unit was formed north of the city but it drew from uh, strongly from the city, but interestingly, it was the commander of the unit, the white commander of the unit who Jim Europe signed up as a soldier. And when it was discovered that he's, he's Jim Europe, the band leader, he was pulled in by the white commander who told him, I want the best damn band in the army. And Europe was given free reign. He went all over recruiting musicians, including he wanted specifically musicians from Puerto Rico. Oh, yeah because there were certain things, certain textures and tonal colors and everything that he wanted in the band. So sorry, I, my geography question isn't, <laughs> isn't satisfactory. Well, they're called Harlem, so, you know, yeah. could be something there. Okay, so I would like to open up questions to this room too. What is it about jazz that makes you happy? <laughs> um, it goes back to when I was a kid, when I was a teenager at the Kennedy Center that afternoon. Uh, yeah, it rearranged my molecules without a doubt. And I, and I think I remember the specific moment. Um, the uh, the very first performer I saw that day was Carmen McRae, great singer. And and I had never heard singing like that. You know, my parents had sort of, and my grandmother had made me watch singers like that on TV. It was kind of like the broccoli of culture, you know, <laughs> do, do what it's good for you, you know. And I'm, you know, I'm a dumb kid. I didn't didn't mean anything to me, but she came out and sang. There's something about the richness of her voice. And then just hearing how she was improvising with the other musicians and the band that came after her was Dave Brubeck. And he came out and just killed the place. And, but I, I really remember we were upstairs where the Terrace Theater is and there were 
different groups set up just in the hallways and out in the open spaces and stuff. And there was this one guitar player and he had, it was like a little trio. And my brother and his friend and I sat down and we were watching and listening to this guy play. And I suddenly kind of just got it, you know, in my dumb little mushy teenager brain, I kind of got it that, you know, this is happening right now and will never happen again. It's, just, it's an absolutely unique moment. <laughs> and I get to be here. And it's so cool. And he had a cool looking guitar. You know, and I was like, you know, <laughs> totally into the gear, right? Um, so that day just kind of changed me. And the, one of the, the last band I saw that afternoon, because we only had afternoon tickets, was um, Dizzy Gillespie was playing with Ron Carter, Herbie Hancock, and Tony Williams, you know, that great rhythm section that Miles had. And Dizzy and these two young brothers from New Orleans, Winton and Branford Marcellus. And Winton, I think, was 19. And like, there's a guy who's not much older than me. And that's a whole other story, but yeah. So, yes. Uh, I know it's hard to generalize, but how did the musicians, the Americans and the French, what language did they use? Did the Americans use French or did the French use English or did they not even try to talk? Did they just play music? How did they communicate? So I'm going to repeat the question for a Zoom audience. So uh, the question was about language. What language did the French and American uh, musicians speak together? And did they even speak or did they communicate through their music? Um, very famous story of the first time that Louis Armstrong and Django Reinhardt played was at the club owned by, um, well, owned by Anna Bricktop Smith. Um, Jean Bullard had hired her over from New York and then she opened her own club. And um, when Louis Armstrong was staying, they had that extended stay in Paris, Django had tried to meet him and it was in his hotel room and Armstrong was kind of fussing with stuff and Django and was still kind of injured. Flustered. And he's still injured. And, <laughs> but then Stefan grappily heard that uh, Armstrong was at Brick Tops. And so he found Django and they went and Django brought his guitar and the story goes that um, he just started to play and Armstrong just started to sing because Django couldn't speak English and Armstrong couldn't speak French. A lot of the musicians who stayed there longer, Americans learned how to speak French perfectly proficiently. Um, a lot of the uh, French musicians did already know how to speak English, um, but there were a lot of times where they did not have a common spoken language, but musically um, they could without any problem at all. Uh, and that still happens. That's That still happens. The young Americans I know who, who live there, they speak French now, but when they first got there, they didn't have anything. They, like, do you have any trouble? Like, like, oh yeah, getting around and, you know, getting confused by stuff. As soon as we start to play, you just play. No. So about every three or four years in the jazz press in, in America, there's usually an article called Jazz is Dead Discuss. And then there's all kinds of letters come in after, of course it's not dead. There's loads of jazz going on here and there and that. But in fact, you know, there's actually a tiny percentage of music sales of jazz when you actually look at things in America. I'm just wondering how that compares with France and if, if jazz is really alive and kicking in France and if there's an infrastructure for jazz with festivals and, uh, you know, Fetnel music and all of those things. and Employment benefits and employment benefits and mm -hmm. financing. So just to repeat the question, um, there's apparently a phrase saying jazz is dead. So the question is, is jazz dead? Is it in the United States? There are some examples where it's still alive, of course, but small percentages. Um, in France, the question is, how, how alive is jazz in Paris? Or France in general, um, and also with, of course, the French musical scene that is supported quite greatly by the French government with a lot of programs for artists that can be sponsored in different ways. Things like Fête de la Musique, which is a, a program in France on, in June where the entire country is a big concert. Every street is a place of concert. So is jazz present in that? Um, so yeah, is jazz alive or not? Jazz is very much alive. Jazz is very much alive. That was a big question we had last year when we did our first production work, uh, first shooting over for the film uh, in Paris. You know, really, what is the scene there? You know, because we could read about it and we could look at websites and we could see playlists and whatever. But, you know, what 
what's it really like just on a nightly basis just going out it's fine <laughs> there's a lot of really good musicians playing in paris as we got to know them um leila olivesi who i pointed out who you'll see in the little teaser she grew up in paris and mm. so she knows everybody and she's in her 30s somewhere and and she was, you know, taking us out to clubs and you got to go to this one, got to do that. But I mean, every night there was plenty, plenty to see and hear. What is it in terms of percentage of music sales? No idea. None. <laughs> I do know that there's a lot of festivals in yeah. Paris, in France in general. Mm -hmm. um, there's the famous festival down in Marciac in the south of France, um, where Wenton has been playing for years and years and years. I mean, one thing I forgot to mention about Duke Ellington is there was... He played in France more than any other country in the world, except the United States. And are there jazz festivals in the U.S. that are famous today? Oh, yeah. There's there's certainly jazz festivals here in the United States, without a doubt. You there's know, one in Newport, I think. The Newport Jazz yes, Festival. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Is, 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 is a huge one. The New Orleans Jazz Festival, Telluride. There's there's several that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, and and the other thing I've noticed here in the United States, and we noticed it in France too, mm -hmm. is the number of young musicians, musicians under the age of 30, who are playing and very much engaged. And, and, and one of the things that we heard a lot about in Paris was the influence of young musicians from all sorts of different parts of the world, particularly the uh, West Africa and the Caribbean and Cuba. We heard that a lot, a lot of Cuban musicians coming to Paris. Mm -hmm. And so the stew is getting very rich there right now, um, which is really, it's fascinating. It's just fascinating. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of actual statistics, I can't give you, but the vibe is great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so now to go uh, to the question of the audience on Zoom again, um, there are two questions. First is how they will receive, so you can receive a, you can, um, well, I think you put it in the comments. So, okay, there was a question on how to listen to the music later. So the real question is, when does the documentary come out and where can people see it? <laughs> the documentary will come out about 18 months after we've finished raising the budget for it. So um, <laughs> it's kind of like building a cathedral when you have the money you build. Um, so we're in that phase right now of, of uh, raising the funds for the money we've had money to begin pre-production and production, which we've started. Um, you'll see a, a very sort of, the audience here, uh, and we'll put it up later, uh, a very early form of a teaser, just to give you sort of a flavor of things that we saw and heard and and some of the ideas we're trying to get across. And where are you hoping to uh, to broadcast it? Well, we would definitely want, um, as we did with the Escogil Lafayette, we want to have it uh, distributed in both the United States and in France. So uh, our previous film was distributed uh, nationally to public television through American public television. And then um, uh, through Terra Nova in different parts of France. So definitely a, a network like Arte mm -hmm. in France uh, would be something we'd be very interested in approaching. And, and you know, as we're as we're really looking to these deeper sort of themes running through everything that we're doing about democracy, you know, as we're approaching the 250th anniversary of America, I think it's a really good time to kind of reflect on what all those things mean. But at the same time, and, and, and in this case, it's a good news story. It's a really good news story. And it's a fun story. And it's a story, it's a story you can listen to while you're making dinner, you know, and it's great for a date night, you know, who knew <laughs> democracy and a date night. Can, can go nicely together, you know. You can get you can, there's, there's a shining example of it right there in front of you, and you know, and you're having a <laughs> glass of wine, and you're with and you and you dance, and yeah, right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's not to love? So another question. Do you find that um, these young musicians in France are sticking to the tradition, or are they creating their no, their own new iteration of this music? Are they Yes. I Sorry. Sorry. I <laughs> um, so just to repeat the question, uh, do the new, does a new generation of the French musicians sort of stick to the older ways of making jazz or do they improvise new or, or evolve music? And the answer to the question is yes, both. Um, um, somebody like, um, excuse me, <clears throat> um, the young bassist who I had up before, uh, Cecile saint -Aimé. you know, here's a 20-something-year-old musician who's 
studying the origins of Creole music in the 19th century in America, 18th century. So going way back and really going into that tradition. And But then what she's writing is brand new compositions, her own. So that's a, that's a good example. There are some who play, you know, straight up big band, you know, totally into Duke. That's what they do. Um, there's uh, musicians who are, you know, incorporating all different sorts of things, um, you know, with hip hop, different kinds of world music. It's a, it's a very broad spectrum. So, and, and one of the things we're noticing is that some of the musicians like Herman Mahari, he's, um, Eritrean by his family, his family's from there, but he grew up in Texas and Kansas City. Um, and he's really interested in that part of the music. But so he'll be playing that for his own with his own band, but then he's playing with a Swiss drummer and a French guitarist, and they're playing this, they're they're trying to come up with this music where you can't tell if it's composed or improvised completely. Mm -hmm. And you know, because some of it is really written out and some of it is completely open. And you, I went to hear them play, and you're like, no, this, I mean, it just, it all just kind of works and gels and suddenly they're all really super tight on something and then it's beautiful. So there's, there's a lot, there's a great wide, wide, wide program. And some are straight, straight down the middle. We're, we're doing 1920s all over again and loving it. So and I think that's a, what you're going to say in that documentary is showing that, right? The new, the younger musicians playing that. So that's really the dynamic yeah. of these exchanges with the past, with the future, with all yeah. these different. So it's not, yeah. it's not just we're preserving this thing in a pure form and we can't, you know, change the mold or anything, not at all. <laughs> but there, but if we're gonna do it that way in that style, we're gonna do it right. So it's very impressive. Perfect, so I think this is a, is a perfect ending. And here in the audience, we have the special luxury of being able to see this film. And for those that are watching on Zoom, uh, you will be able to see the teaser um, when it will be edited in that video. So you can subscribe to the Friends in the US YouTube channel to see that. So thank you very much. And for us here, we are gonna see the, the trailer. All right. Yeah. <laughs> You know, Paris is a great city for jazz. If you know the history of Paris and all the things that have happened here, um, and, and this is one of these histories. You can see uh, them playing like this, like in a, a place like this, and the pe all people are, are dancing. Paris was jumping. He said you could run into all the black people in Paris, just stand on the corner long enough. Django said, I'm looking for a violin player, and Stefan, I think, he thought, I'm looking for a guitar player. <laughs> for Django, it was Django's band, and for Stefan, it was, it was Stefan's band. <laughs> in 1933 was a great step for Ellington's music. Uh, a very great um, acknowledgement of his uh, value, you know, his quality as a composer and as a, a leader of his orchestra. It was new for them that people are really considering the, their music seriously. Armstrong, Dizzy Gillespie, Duke Ellington, Oscar Peterson, Ornette Coleman, chaque étudiant du quartier latin connaît chacun de ces noms. 
This is the first place that I've been at where not only do I know the musicians on the scene, but I also know the club owners and the people who work, who work in the clubs on the scene, and that, that really helps a lot. It's like a community. The other thing that I like about France is that they really respect their artists. They just do. You know, the world is changing for many reasons. Yes. That, you know, so much that people are looking for something that it's uh, helping them to go through all that challenges we'll face. If you have problems, if you don't trust the world anymore, if you feel upset about something, play music, compose a song, share music with people, everything is gone.